A lot to discuss, and to do that, we are joined by two prominent Austin attorneys, Adam Lowy and Brad Vinson. Thank you both so much for joining us. So we had all been talking throughout the course of this trial, and I just want to ask, Adam, I'll start with you. Were you surprised by the jury's verdict today? I was very surprised. The state had a very high burden here. This was a very difficult case, and the jury was out for almost two days, and to come back with a guilty finding on murder was a surprise to me. And it's a big win by the state, and it's a big win by the district attorney. And the thing that I keep thinking about is this question. Should Daniel Perry have testified in his own defense? That was a very difficult decision for the defense to make during trial. They decided not to have him testify. But I think in this county, a jury wants to hear from a person who is claiming self-defense. And they want him to swear an oath and explain why he felt he was in danger. And I think in retrospect, it was a big mistake not to put him on the stand. Brad, I want to ask you, what in your mind were sort of the turning points or the pivotal moments in, in this case? Sure, I, I think the, the turning moment in this case is the text messages and the social media posts of Daniel Perry. I think they changed the entire trial. I think you look at the facts alone, the jury is able to come to some reasonable doubt based on where the car is at, the position of the protesters, the position of Garrett Foster, the position of his arms, and whether he raised the gun or not, and whether or not Perry had the right to act in self-defense. But when you bring those messages in, it gives the jurors exactly what every juror wants. What was going on inside his head at the time that this happened? And that, to them, is what was going on in his head, that he, that he had almost put himself in this position. At least I think that's what the jury came to. And the state put forth some of those messages. I just want to share one of them was, quote, I might have to kill a few people on my way to work. They are rioting outside my apartment. Another one said, quote, I might go to Dallas to shoot looters. Adam, do you agree that that those messages, which, by the way, some of the messages were public social media posts, but others were were messages on Facebook Messenger. So reminder, by the way, that we are all responsible for anything we write, even if we think it may not be public. But Adam, do you similarly feel that that was a turning point in this case? Without a doubt. And I think that's going to be a very big appellate issue as to whether those messages should have come in. But Judge Brown's a very good judge. He decided to let them in. And I think he's correct. I think that at the end of the day, the jury wants to be able to tell itself a story. So when the state presents this and say, look, this guy was looking for a fight, this guy was looking for trouble to shoot protesters, and this is what happened, I think the jury believed it. And then going back to my original point, I think it was incumbent upon Daniel Perry to take the stand and try to explain those, and more importantly explain, I was in danger for my life when I turned on Congress. And I think that that's what sunk him eventually. Brad, we know that from the word go, from the moment that this happened, that this case has been highly political, highly politicized. Of course, we're talking about a social justice, Black Lives Matter protest. There's also the issue of the right to carry openly here in the state of Texas. But I wanted to ask you, you know, at the end of the day, we saw a lot of, a lot of discussion on social media, out in the community. But it's a reminder for all of us again, too, that at the end of the day, what really matters are those 12 men and women in the jury box. That's right. It's the most powerful thing that we have in the justice system. I, I frequently tell juries that they're the most powerful people in the courtroom, more powerful than the prosecutor, the defense attorney, or the judge. They're there to decide a person's fate. They uphold our entire system, right? And I think you and I had discussed the fact that this is why juries exist for these exact cases. When you have facts this close and neither side can figure out which way this thing is going to go, that's why a trial happens. A trial happens because neither side has a slam dunk case. There are issues on both sides that are good and bad that a jury has to decide. And that's what happened today. But Adam, we have certainly come a long way from the lead detective in this case, essentially determining on his own, based on his investigation, that he believed that the shooting was an act of self-defense, that it was justified. We've come a long way from a back and forth about whether or not Jose Garza and his administration presented a fair case to the grand jury. What do you make of all the politics around this case? Again, given what happened in the months preceding it and the jury's decision today. I think Brad's correct that all the stuff running up to a jury trial is important, but at the end of the day, when you put 12 people in a box, they're gonna hear a set of stories and they're gonna believe one side or the other. And in this case, after deliberating for almost two days, they believed what the state was saying. And so I was very surprised 
that they basically disregarded Detective Fugit's conclusion, but that's why we have juries. They are able to look at all of the evidence and make their own determination. To get into the legal weeds a little bit here, Brad, what do you make of the fact that uh, they found him guilty on the murder charge, but not guilty on the ag assault charge? How, how do you make sense of that? Right, uh, you know, I, I think that um, when you're looking at that, I think it also says, it also tells us why the state didn't go for a felony murder trial, right? Because they, they didn't go with the angle that uh, Foster was at any point acting in defense of the crowd, right? And, and I think that that is shown by the jury's verdict on the not guilty regarding the ag assault deadly weapon. Um, I, I think that the jury is signaling that he's, he's there at that moment for the purpose that he was there, which was to commit murder and not to run people over, but that he came there looking to antagonize the situation. That's what the jury decided. And to talk about the politics that you were discussing, I, I think that, um, I, I guess the, the question has to be asked, why was APD investigating the case in the first place, right? When you have a demonstration, you have a protest that is voicing their, uh, their opinion and negative feelings about APD, someone is shot and killed, and then APD is the lead investigative force in that, I think in order to have absolved themselves and, and helped you know, stay clear of the situation, they should have allowed another agency to come in and investigate this case. Certainly one reason we have trials is to gauge community sentiment on a number of different issues and, and crimes in our community. This is the first trial that we've had in Austin, the first significant trial. We have had some trials in recent months, but the first high profile trial. Do you make any assessments, Adam, or determinations about what this may or may not say about juror sentiment in our community? particularly as it relates to uh, the idea of using deadly force against someone. It's particularly important as we look toward uh, police officers who have been indicted. Yes, I believe there has been a very big shift in the past about seven years, starting with the Black Lives Matter movement going into summer 2020 to this day, in which when I started my career here, it was almost impossible to hold a police officer criminally or civilly liable for their conduct. That has changed. We have seen some very big civil verdicts. We have seen police officers indicted by the grand jury, and we are about to see criminal trials happen. And I think when I look at this Perry verdict tonight, and I think about these upcoming police trials, I think anything could possibly happen. I think juries here are going to evaluate the cases on the facts, and if the state can prove that a police officer committed a crime, they will be held accountable. But if the defense can prove it was not a crime, I believe the police officer will walk. But unlike other decades, it is totally fair game that anything could happen in these cases right now. Brad, in just a few weeks, we're going to see Austin Police Officer Christopher Taylor stand trial in, in the death of Michael Ramos, a very significant, high-profile local police case. As you look to the future, can you take anything that, that happened today and you know, potentially apply that to what may or may not happen in that case. Sure, and I think it, it piggies back off of, off of what Adam said, that the juries are willing to make tough decisions. The juries are making decisions based on the facts and they're not allowing people in their positions to influence their decisions when they're making those conclusions, right? Um, I, I think that that case is going to be just as heavily charged as this one, right? It, it, maybe more so. Um, we're going to have to see what the video looks like. Did, did Ramos speed towards the officers or not? That could be the deciding fact. And if the jury gets to see that, depending on what happens there, could change the verdict in the case. We've also got the De Silva case coming up after Ramos as well. Officer Taylor was involved in the shooting of both of those individuals under circumstances in which he has been indicted for murder in both of those cases. I think that that's pretty significant that you have an officer who has shot and killed two people in less than a year and been indicted for murder in both of those cases. And I hope that the jury finds the right answer in both of those cases, evaluates the evidence and comes to the right conclusion. And just as a point there, you represent the De Silva family in a civil, that it, a civil case. Against that is them. correct. We are currently representing the De Silva family in a case against APD. I want to ask both of you, just in closing, uh, Judge Brown, Judge Cliff Brown, uh, who has been on the bench a number of years here in Travis County, will m assess the penalty for Daniel Perry. He will decide uh, if he goes to prison and for how long. Uh, what is he thinking this weekend as he looks at, well, he has seen the evidence, but what are the factors in both of your minds that he will consider? Um, and, and if you had to make some sort of estimation, what, what kind of 
possible prison sentence could Daniel Perry be looking at? Well, J Judge Brown is one of the best judges in Travis County. He's very fair. He will look at all of the evidence. One thing to keep in mind is that these social media posts that were entered into evidence were not all of the evidence. Judge Brown kept a lot of them out. But importantly, Judge Brown saw all of them. So I can't imagine that doesn't influence his decision somewhat. If I had to guess, and it's only a guess, I think he will sentence Perry to 20 to 30 years in prison, and then I think the appellate fight begins. It's always a scale whenever a judge or a jury is deciding punishment, and the idea of going to the judge is that a judge has seen thousands and thousands of cases, whereas a jury, this could have been the only case they've ever seen. So the idea is that the judge will cut a middle difference a little bit better than a jury would. And I think that was the calculation by the defense in going with the judge, should they lose. I think he probably lands somewhere around 40 years. And I think that it's based on the same way it is in any criminal case. Prior, you know, does he have prior criminal history? What was the level of culpable mental intent, right? If he had been going above and beyond, doing even more than just the social posts for weeks leading up, had a plan written out, those are more kind of cold-blooded, you know, type thoughts, right? And should be probably punished more. So I think that he lands somewhere around 40, but he takes into, into fact all of the social posts as well. Brad Benson and Adam Lowy, thank you both so much for your thoughts on this really important case. Yeah. Appreciate you coming in.